One of the ideas that has most excited the community here on my channel is the idea of the solar gravitational lens. This is sending a spacecraft out to about a thousand astronomical units from the sun at the point where the gravity of the sun becomes a natural telescope lens and it lets you see exoplanets with a resolution that there's just no other way to do it. You would see a megapixel image of a planet orbiting another star, say 100 light years away. It's an astonishing idea, but it requires building a spacecraft that can get you out to that distance and operate for decades to be able to pull this off. So how are we going to do that part, the building the spacecraft part? Well, I'm pleased to say I've got another interview here with Dr. Slava Tershev. He was the original proponent of the solar gravitational lens, but to bring this into being, he is now working on a concept of a sun diver solar sail spacecraft that would fall to the sun, use the uh, enormous energy coming out of the sun as a way to accelerate a spacecraft to the kinds of velocities that it would take to be able to get a spacecraft out to the solar gravitational lens within our lifetime, or I guess specifically within Dr. Tereshev's lifetime, because he really wants to see that picture. But a recent paper that he worked on really brought in every single person who is active in the realm of solar system exploration, like every name associated with this paper, I'm familiar with and, and have interviewed many in the past. So to see all of these people come together for this one idea led by Dr. Tereshev, I had to get on board and interview him and talk about it. So as always, it's a fascinating conversation with Dr. Tereshev. Here it is. Enjoy. Well, Dr. Tereshev, it's great to see you again. It's lovely to be here with you, Fraser. Wonderful. Uh, so you, the last interview that we did about the solar gravitational lens has been one of the more popular interviews on the channel, and for good reason. I mean, it's, it's an idea that just really inspires people. And I think I have to answer a question or two every week in my question show about the implications of the solar gravitational lens. So, so you have inspired the world with this idea and it really feels like it's it's taking off. Uh, Fraser, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for helping us to um, to bring this story to people because I think with the solar gravitational lensing, uh, this generation of humans uh, has the chance to see surfaces of exoplanets yeah. in our stellar neighborhood. Otherwise, we need to reserve a sort of resort to very large telescopes which are not going to be built anytime soon or if ever because as as we discussed last time basically to build an image to have an image of uh, an exo earth situated at 100 light years away from us if you want to make that image with just one pixel something called diffraction limit mandates you to have access to a telescope requires to, to have a telescope of 90 kilometers it's not possible ever so yeah. realistically, solar gravitational lens is the only way for us to see surfaces. And I've been seeing the concept referenced quite a bit in a lot of other papers where people are talking about new methods of propulsion and they're saying, oh, and this would be a good application to create the solar gravitational lens, or these are problems that we could solve if we could do the solar gravitational lens. So you can kind of see this hunger coming from both the astronomical community as well as the sort of space exploration community to see this happen. So are there any updates since we last talked? Like, you know, is anyone anyone building the mission yet or any any propulsion systems that you think are, are really going to be a way to do it? Our funding from NASA uh, that we received for the last five years to work on this mission and the solar gravitational lens uh, uh, theory behind it and understanding how it works. That funding uh, uh, completed was is over as of September last year. So we do not have uh, um, new funding to continue with the work, but we still do it. There is right. a large community of people um, in uh, in the United States who are very much interested uh, to uh, continue with this work. And especially I noticed that when I give talks at universities, I'm so excited to see how I eyes lit up because for, 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 for many people, 
this is a unique chance uh, to, re to recognize that it's possible. It's possible for this generation of humans to see surfaces of exoplanets. And so we are now building the community. We are going out there and uh, uh, bringing more people who are willing to work on this mission development. And so we are now establishing something called nonprofit, where we will start raising money to start building the mission uh, soon, but not the mission to the solar gravitational lens yet. Because um, as we discussed last time, we need to demonstrate some technologies before we'll em embrace with the mission. Our plan is to be able to demonstrate all the critical technologies within the next uh, eight to 12 years. And so to fly the mission to the SGL sometime middle 2030s. And so the key technology that we need to demonstrate is propulsion. So propulsion, uh, we realize that during the, uh, our work on uh, NIAC, uh, our, on that grant, we realized that there are a few technologies out there. For, first of all, chemical propulsion. Of course, chemical propulsion is the most mature technology that we have today. And we are flying amazing missions like SpaceX does an amazing job, flying more and more um, uh, spacecraft. And now we are waiting for Starship to take off uh, very, uh, very soon, hopefully. And so that will be an enormous capability that we'll have access to. But even that will not allow us to get to the solar gravitational lens within the lifetime of a scientist. And so we're talking about sort of a natural, a natural emotional d d duration for the project, lifetime of a scientist. We're talking about uh, about the project that is about 40 years or uh, the, the duration for the project. Uh, it's about 40 years duration. So we need to fly it now so, so that, look, for me, by the time I'm 100 years old, I want to see the image of exoplanets. You want to see that picture, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. This is it. Yeah. So people are saying, look, you need to either move faster or live longer. And I prefer to do both. And I hope right. your audience shares the same sentiment. So I yep. wish everyone live, move faster and live longer. So, but now coming back to the technologies, we need to start flying things, solar sailing things, because um, solar sailing technology, we realize, is the only way for us in the near future to actually see the increase in velocities of um, a spacecraft going through the solar system. And so with solar sailing, it's a mature technology. It had been, uh, we have flown multiple spacecraft in Earth uh, orbit. We have uh, tra traveled towards Venus with uh, Icarus. We have flown light sail around Earth. We have we are developing many more uh, space missions, but we need to start flying around the sun. So once we get to the sun, this is the uh, area where uh, we get the largest solar radiation pressure. And so therefore we have access to the largest um, uh, propellant tank in a sense. Right. And propellant <laughs> tank is a solar radiation pressure. The closer you come to the sun, the faster you go out. And so now, with, you go ahead. Now, sorry. So I just want, I just got to stop you for one second, just because you like, you're now starting to lead into the next topic of conversation, which is the paper that you and an all-star team of scientists developed called Science Opportunities with Solar Sailing Small Sats. And this paper dropped about two weeks ago on Archive. And I saw your name at the beginning. I'm like, okay, all right, well, I will read it. And then I saw all the other names that are associated with this paper. And I, like, I've just got to tell people. So You've got, uh, and like, I'm just recognizing names that I know, like uh, Andreas Hein, who I've interviewed in the past, Nathan Barnes. You've got Constantine Badigan and Michael Brown, who are the team who are looking for uh, Planet Nine, as well as, you know, Pluto killing uh, Michael Brown. Uh, you've got uh, T. Marshall Eubanks. You've got Sarah Gibson. You've got... Um, uh, Carolyn Porco, who, you know, ran the imaging for the Cassini spacecraft, yes. Mark Sykes, like Pete Warden, who used to run NASA Ames and is sort of really interested in advanced technology. So like every one of these names that are associated with this paper are kind of visionaries in exploring the outer solar system to some extent. Like, did you like assemble the, like, what, how did this come together? Did you assemble the Avengers? What happened? Thank you for bringing this uh, up. Um, this paper was on the, in the development for the last at least half a year. We, we, we held uh, several workshops. We organized several meetings where many people came together and discussed opportunities uh, to explore solar system. 
And uh, it, it is an outgrowth of our NIAC effort, studying solar gravitational lens, because we emphasized in our efforts that we need to have a better propulsion capabilities. If you will be bitten on chemical propulsion, we will not be able to see um, so uh, the surfaces of exoplanets. So for us to realize that solar ceiling is the key, we realize that we need to start flying soon. And the technology demonstration mission that we discuss in this paper, essentially the first step that we need to take uh, to uh, enable this new capability. But now with this, once we have flown a mission that is actually reaching uh, velocity twice the Voyager, so we're talking about Voyager speed. Voyager 1 is about 3.2 astronomical units per year. So it's about 16 kilometers a second. But if we move faster, twice that, and uh, we, are not, we are not stopping there. So with the technology that we have already in, 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 in at hand, essentially the sail materials, uh, avionics, computers, um, the sensors, we don't need to develop anything. We have a lot of technologies that will allow us to take our sailcraft to uh, to quarter of an AU from the sun. And then as we're flying by the sun, uh, the solar radiation pressure will push our spacecraft and we'll, we will be able to reach with the currently available technology velocities twice the Voyager. And that's a unique revelation where people realize, oh, with this technology, we can do this, we can do that. And suddenly it's a paradigm shift. Paradigm shift because for the last, what, 50 years, we have flown only six spacecraft beyond the orbit of Jupiter. And we can name the, you know, Voyager 1, Voyager 2, Pioneer 10, Pioneer 11, Galileo, Cassini, New Horizons. So all of those wonderful uh, missions went beyond uh, the orbit of Jupiter or just uh, just uh, reached the Jupiter. And June, of course, uh, is there. So JUICE was uh, JUICE was launched, uh, what, a few today, I guess. <laughs> Your space agency launched this. But now we're talking about it's one spacecraft pretty much every eight years. It's not enough. For example, a PhD graduate today, when she graduates from a university and she is choosing a science team somewhere in the industry and uh, proposing a mission, it will take a couple of times to get to a successful proposal. So by the age of 50, she will see her instrument on the launch pad. That's, that's we should do better. We should do better. <laughs> right. So basically, it's, we're talking be again about lifetime of a scientist. So if a scientist work only for one mission at a time or, 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 during lifetime, it's not good. It's not good for the science. It's not good for the profession. It's not good for the area. So we need to change something. And so when we uh, discussed our ap uh, approach to start flying solar cell emissions in the, in the solar system, these people whom you mentioned, they realize that they have an opportunity of a lifetime, essentially to develop a capability to address the most important problems in the solar system. For example, one of those missions, I think uh, early on, we realized that solar polar imager, that's the mission that will be needed to look at the polar regions of the sun. It's a holy grail of heliophysics. As you're familiar with the Cassini mission, when Cassini flown in the polar regions of Saturn, we saw that hexagonal structure in the polar regions of Saturn, a similar structure we expect to see on the polar regions of the sun. And so that will tell us a lot about the history of the sun, about the solar behavior. But to do this with chemical propulsion, it's not, it will be extremely expensive because now we need to go all the way to Jupiter, then do a gravitational maneuver around Jupiter, falling back onto the sun, changing the inclination, and then going by the sun, we need to have solar rocket booster, we need to have uh, thermal shielding. And so we're talking about 1500 kilogram spacecraft with a little heavy thermal shielding. And so we right there, a couple billion dollars uh, mission. So that's basically the challenge we are facing. It's those right. missions we can we can fly, but they will be very expensive. So like this team, then each one of them is focused in a different area of solar system exploration, interstellar exploration, interstellar flight. But the but the problem that they share is that they need a propulsion system that gets their mission out to the target within their lifetime. Absolutely. This is a recognized problem within this uh, science community. We are limited by propulsion. And so uh, uh, I'm very honored uh, that very uh, uh, interesting, very uh, bright people joined us on this white paper, on this document, essentially 
rep- uh, that that's a good indication that this capability is very much in dem- it, it very much missing so we need to develop the capability so we can explore areas of uh, heliophysics uh, astrophysics uh, planetary sciences there is a lot of things to be done in the solar system and we should change the way we do things and so these people who joined us on this uh, on this document they definitely realize that this is a capability that is within the reach and we have the good way to actually start flying things uh, soon and within uh, i'm i'm happy that everyone who is on this paper re- represents a different segment of the science on the sort of science opportunities but jointly we support this development and we hope that the science community will recognize this uh, this and so soon our funding agencies nasa and the and the, the government will also recognize that yes we need to start flying we need to start building things and we are not talking about hundreds of millions of dollars our technology demonstration mission as we as we worked with aerospace corporation and jpl during the our nayak phase phase three study the cost of the for that mission are 17 million so we're talking about at the cost of 20 million dollars we can fly a mission that will go around the sun will reach velocities twice voyager will come back at earth for example for a checkup and then we'll continue to move beyond the earth orbit until basically the communication will last okay so let's 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 talk about this i want like i want to specifically talk about what you're proposing with the sun diver so what how does this work what is the what is the plan that is a very clean idea so in this case uh, think about solar uh yeah to think about a sailboat with a sailboat you have a sail you have a wind you have rudder and your sailboat can go almost against the wind tacking against the wind if you are if you you've been if, if you've been on a sailboat you know what i'm talking about so potentially you can go almost against the wind we have developed a new architecture for sailcraft um the new architecture uses something we call articulatable veins because typical architecture for the sailcraft uh, and most mature and uh, flown most of the times, essentially it's a planar sail where you have a rectangular structure of a gossamer foil that is very lightweight and uh, very large. So we're talking about, let's say, 20 by 20 meters. And so you need to fly that thing in space. You need to unfold. And then the challenge will be to uh, control it, to change the direction, to be able to uh, direct it to go in the area or in the... In the in the in the direction you, you want it to go so planar sails are very difficult to navigate there is extra weight you have to carry with you when you fly in space and then deployment mechanism controlling it with the uh, variable uh sort of uh, uh, variable articulatable mass position of the spacecraft so there are some uh, some, some technologies available to control planar sailcraft but not then they're, they're not easy to come by very difficult to control and basically deployment controllability of the planar sails is a big challenge what we have done, uh, think about um, uh, like a, a golf club uh, box. Essentially, you're flying in a launch vehicle, you have a golf club box. Essentially, it's it's in a stalled position, you fly it in space and as a ride share. So we don't require the full launch vehicle as a, at a very affordable cost, you fly it as a ride share. Once we're in space, once we deployed in space, we open that glove box and uh, start deploying our sail like an umbrella. Essentially, it's very simple deployment. You have a hinge mechanism. Uh, then b- b- essentially, the um, uh, veins will be unfolded once, and then they will be unfurled, maybe sort of extended. So there are only two deployment mechanisms, spring-loaded mechanisms that allow you to actually deploy it. So you, there is no extra parasitic weight. And so those veins, think about like an umbrella. You're in, sp- you're in space, you open up. And with this umbrella... Uh, it has uh, uh, different segments. It's not a total umbrella. It's not sort of enveloping the whole 360 degrees. There will be different sectors of that umbrella where you can change angle of each of those sectors. Okay. So you and can so you can kind of like back to that sailboat analogy. You can tighten different parts of the vein that will then change your attitude towards the sun and change the, the i guess what direction you're getting your velocity in return and you can kind of tack in different directions just by pulling in these different veins and just sort of changing the shape of your sail exactly and uh, with this um this is a full analogy with the sailboat because now we can uh, um in 
uh, we can articulate vein individually, every vein. And so we can change the course where we're going. So uh, the analogy with sailboat, now we have the sail, we have solar radiation pressure, and we have reaction wheels. And so now you can actually articulate uh, those veins and the move at will where you want to go. So now a sail will be navigable system. You can navigate. You can control direction where you go. And so it's like a, 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 when airplane has a surface controls. When you fly a plane, you have uh, you have a, you have a rudder, you have uh, ailerons, you have uh, all the surface controls. Similar controllability now will be enabled on the on the sailcraft. And uh, the key parameter for every sailboat is the total uh, surface area ratio between the total surface area to the total mass of the spacecraft. So area to mass ratio. The larger that parameter is, the faster your spacecraft will go. So in the past, if you uh, built a very large sail, it will be it will be very difficult to deploy a large mass on that on that sail. So essentially, the challenges would be to deploy that sail still keeping the mass uh, kind of si uh, sizable in a sense. You have instruments, you have uh, avionics, and so area to mass ratio. Typically, the largest area to mass ratio was for the near scout spacecraft that unfortunately didn't call home. So it was uh, 7.3 meters square per, per kilogram. With our design already, we already surpassed that uh, parameter by a factor of three at least. And so we will be reaching, we, we now have technology demonstration mission prototype. That sailcraft already has uh, the area to mass ratio of 25 meters per second square, per, 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 per kilogram. And uh, when we fly uh, the mission, the TDM will have a factor of 50. So 50 wow. meters squared per kilogram, which is a major advancement compared to the sails that were flown until recently. The flown sails have that parameter at the level of roughly three. So we're talking about 50. So we already, within the design, we increased that parameter quite drastically. Now right. we need to demonstrate this in flight. Right. So you have this, you have this, uh, I guess, solar sail, or I'm trying to think of an analogy, right? Like you have a car with a big engine, with the biggest engine that's, in in term in the solar sail world um you have like you have a very high thrust to weight ratio which allows you to go fast when you need to so where do you so what is the trajectory that you fly that takes advantage of this high performance solar sail um not only we can uh choose the trajectory we can throttle that engine and so the throttle comes from, from the fact that we actually can articulate veins and we can change the thrust vector direction and the thrust magnitude. So that's something that allows you to implement on a sailcraft that was not known before. So now you can have a controllable thrust vector and uh, you can articulate the magnitude of that vector. So that's something that was not possible before. With this trajectory, with this technology, what can we do? Um, first of all, we launch from um, uh, uh, on uh, uh, right, right share. Uh, so basically, we will buy a place in one of the upcoming Falcon 9 flights or Virgin uh, Orbit, or uh, unfortunately, Virgin Orbit yeah. is no longer available. <laughs> but uh, we will fly in space, right. then we will open uh, the sail. And with that sail, we can start dropping the, our uh, kinetic energy. Because we, what, what we need to do when Earth moves around the Sun, it moves around. Uh, it moves in orbit, where potential and kinetic energies are sort of uh, pretty much the same, equal to each other. When we start dr dropping the velocity, you start coming closer to the Sun, and so the sailcraft uh, will allow you to drop the velocity to to, to 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 reduce the velocity. And so, essentially, in about seven months, we'll be flying by Mercury, and then in about one month after after the fly, flying by Mercury, we'll be flying through the solar perihelion. During the solar perihelion flyby, we approach the, uh, the, uh, the, the sun at the distance of roughly a quarter of an AU. So a quarter of an astronomical wow. unit, it's within the orbit of Mercury. When we come to, the, uh, to that distance, we know that there will be a significant thermal loading from the sun. So our design allows us to compensate for, for, for whatever thermal loads will be on the system. So the sail, the, the sail material will, be, uh, will, will, will survive. Uh, the thermal design that we have will uh, enable the survivability of the entire vehicle. As we approach this quarter of an AU distance, we will be able to see the stars to navigate. 
uh, to to read the stellar positions, to reorient the spacecraft. It will be completely autonomous flight. Uh, here, we will not be able to track the sailcraft with the DSN antenna, for example, or any optical telescope, because we will have to point at the sun. And so in this case, we will have to trust our vehicle. And that's an amazing step for the space industry, because now we navigate our spacecraft trying to control them in real time. So, for example, when we when we fly to the moon, it's a, the round trip flight time is about a second and a half. Going to Mars, it's a 16 minutes one way. And uh, so we still try to navigate uh, sort of not in real time, but we design the system to, for, for it to survive this entry, descent and landing on Mars. We'll have the same capability deployed on the sailcraft because when we go around the sun, we will not be able to navigate it anymore. It will have to read the algorithms that we deploy on the onboard computer. We'll be able to reorient its sails to compensate for any unwanted spin if there will be a, a vehicle will enter spin because of the sort of veins will not be uh, adjusted. Uh, the angles will be different, so it, it may spin, but with the uh, controllability and with the ability to articulate the veins, we'll be able to stop the spinning, we'll be able to uh, uh, dynamically control the flight path. As we're going by the solar uh, uh, perihel at the solar perihelion, uh, we are moving very fast already. So, but then the sails will be oriented in such a way so to position the spacecraft to get as much solar radiation pressure as possible at this distance. Constantly adjusting the direction. Uh, we'll be moving, I think, about 60 kilometers a second back then. Wow. So, so that will be uh, faster than anything else. So, I mean, we will be moving for anything for any spacecraft that actually in the uh, deep solar system. And this so, is an old Earth remover maneuver, right? That's this essentially is essentially we're using the solar radiation pressure as an orbit maneuver. So that is something that's orbit maneuver, but it's not solid rocket boosters or any 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 motors. We're using the sun solar radiation pressure for that. And so we do the orbit maneuver. We then reorient the spacecraft so that will be the sun will be completely behind it. We'll be pushing in the sails and then we'll move fast. So the point is, once we do that, we'll reach the velocities with the technology demonstration mission. We'll reach the velocities roughly seven astronomical units per year. And and just for people who maybe aren't familiar with that term, I just you know, it, tell me if I'm wrong here. But like essentially, if you fire your rockets at the closest point at your perihelion or at your, you know, uh, then you get a magnification for the remainder of your flight, that that's the best time to fire your rockets when you get the closest to the gravitational body that you are slingshotting around. That's the most effective way to improve, increase the velocity of your spacecraft. So when right. you're going by the gravitating body, you, you, you use rocket motors, either chemical or solid, rocket motors, or in this case, we'll be using solar radiation pressure for that purpose. And in this case, that would uh, allow us to move much, much faster than possibly uh, with current technologies. And so you come hurtling around the sun, and now you are leaving the sun with this additional acceleration. What kind of a velocity are you now leaving the solar neighborhood with? Uh, we will be living um, with a velocity of roughly 3.5 to uh, 4 astronomical units per year. And as we move, wow, the first astronomical unit, if, as we move towards Earth, uh, the solar radiation pressure will continue to accelerate our vehicle. And so by the time we'll reach the orbit of Earth, we'll be moving at about 5 to 7 AU. And 5 to 7 years. AU per year. Exactly. So you move from the sun to the earth in a couple of months. Yep. And then a few months after that, you go past Mars. Yep. And then within a year, you're past Jupiter. Right. And within about a year, you're going past, with about a year and a half, you're going past Saturn. That's there. This is what you want to do. This is what you want to demonstrate. But the yes. first step, of course, we need to make sure that our vehicle will survive the solar perihelion to show that we can do it. And then uh, uh, to show that we can navigate that vehicle, we can control the flight path for the flight path. And so once we do that, probably we'll fly by one of the asteroids just to show how we can operate uh, uh, of that sailcraft to enable precision navigation. Because uh, solar sailing spacecraft are not known for precision navigation. It's very hard to navigate. We need to demonstrate two two things. First one is that we can move fast and also that we can navigate the sailcraft. 
And so this will be the objective for the first uh, technology demonstration mission. And so maybe we'll have an, a camera on board, maybe we'll have some, some instruments to do some science on as we go. And uh, But that mission will not be capable of uh, going to the deep solar system because for that we would need some autonomous energy solar, power sources because the solar radiation of the sun, we can use the sun probably to the distance of three astronomical units. We can still uh, reliably use the sun, the solar light to charge the batteries. But beyond that, despite we have a significant real estate on the sail craft, the sail areas were uh, rather large. We cannot cover the full solar area with the photovoltaic elements. Only part of it will be covered. So realistically, and when we talk about exploring deep solar system, we need uh, 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 some uh, some uh, sources of uh, some in, uh, some independent power, autonomous power, and for that we have radioisotope th- uh, sources, planar elements that are being now developed under NASA funding at the Aerospace Corporation, and so those little tiles that we can put on the sailcraft, those tiles will actually uh, they they use they use radioisotopes. Those tiles are connected to a, a flight ba- to, to the uh, onboard battery. They will be able to charge the battery, so that sailcraft will then be able to continue beyond the three AU, beyond the five AU, and then healthy operating all the way to uh, forty AU and even beyond. So, with the technology that we have today, but your, I mean, your spacecraft is going to be on an es- like the for the prototype, it will be on an escape trajectory. It yes. will just run out of power. Once it gets too far away from the sun, Absolutely. I know like like at Jupiter, you need 25 times as much solar panels to operate than what you need at Earth. And right. solar panels are are, are heavy. Mm-hmm. Um, so 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 your prototype won't have the RTG. So it'll it'll lose its right. power at a certain point. Right. But the but but a small RTG that could provide power for long duration is within our current technology yes and we are building those uh, um, uh, flight elements uh, as we speak so those uh, technologies i think will be available in the next three years and so putting this technology on the sailcraft will benefit from three ongoing revolutions in space first one is of course miniaturization of spacecraft so now we're talking about cubesat uh, instruments cubesat uh, cubesat uh, spacecraft uh, or the CubeSat size spacecraft, small sites are very capable. They have uh, uh, proven maturity on multiple uh, multiple flights. And the most exciting, I think, for me uh, was the operation of two Marco spacecraft that were developed by JPL and flown to Mars. When InSight lander was landing on Mars during the entry, descent, and landing, the two 6U CubeSats were able to translate that uh, sort of uh, uh, to... Uh, translate that imagery and data from uh, from the uh, from the uh, inside lander on Mars directly to Earth. So that was established. Six U CubeSats in the, in, in, were able to communicate with Earth uh, with Earth tra- transmitting the information about. This was a big in- surprise to me because, like, when I first learned about those missions, I was like, okay, they've, they've got these small CubeSats that are flying along, and they're going to send their data to one of the motherships at Mars, and then that Mar- that data is going to be sent back to Earth. And then as I did more digging, I'm like, no, it's the opposite. Like, it's the direct. These right. spacecraft, these tiny little spacecraft are capable of gathering data and transmitting their information to home and can even serve as a relay for other spacecraft at Mars to send data home. And so now when you think about like you've got these small, you know, the 6U, like I'm holding sort of like a football site object in my sort of imagination, like these 6U CubeSats are teeny tiny and 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 yet can have all of this capability on board. And for the TDM, we use the same uh, spacecraft components that were flown um, for uh, on uh, Marcos. So the same electronic components, the same uh, onboard uh, processors, the same uh, star trackers, the same reaction wheels. So we are not developing technology. We're demonstrating the capabilities of the technology that does exist now. The only new capability that we'll demonstrate is solar sailing, uh, uh, solar flyby. So that the at the close proximity, the, uh, the the fact that we can survive the solar perihelion and still have a healthy, uh, uh, controllable spacecraft, that will be something that we'll demonstrate. And then, as an outcome, as I said, uh, the speed of the vehicle and the way that we will be we will be able to control it. 
So, but that is the first vehicle. Then we expect that once that will be done, we can start flying some science instruments on those uh, those missions and do some science. And realistically, think about this uh, with the sailcraft. There is a lot of options now open for us. For example, even in the even be even before we go to to the sun, we can use those sailcraft as Amazon delivery trucks between high Earth orbit and the moon. So you can uh, use the same uh, sailcraft uh, vehicle that we have developed. Uh, for three purposes. One is the solar salient for the propulsion. Then you have uh, photovoltaic elements embedded on the surface of the sail for power, because the solar power is there uh, when we go around the, between Earth and the Moon. And we can use the same sails for communication, uh, for radio communication with the, uh, with the ground, because we can use software-defined radios, so we can use uh, phased arrays on the sailcraft, or maybe bend the uh, area of the sailcraft to make a parabolic antenna, so that we'll be able to communicate with Earth. Now it doesn't need power, it doesn't need uh, propulsion, it doesn't need anything. It just moves between Earth and the Moon and does what it does. So wow. something that is a very low thrust trajectory, but you can uh, start exploring the Moon at a cost of under $20 million, which is uh, not hundreds of millions of dollars that uh, flagship missions would cost. Once we do that, and now they're uh, exploring the near-Earth asteroids, for example, for resource location in the future. Flying in in this area will be much cheaper, and universities can do that. You don't have to allocate significant budgets for that. But my desire, my wish is that we'll start flying around the sun soon. So my the first mission that I'm interested in, essentially the technology demonstration mission, we don't have a good name for it yet. So if your viewers will suggest a good name, it's a sun diver's paradigm. So we'll be diving to the sun and essentially we'll then be re-emerging from the other side of the sun with the very fast velocities. And so with that solar system now, it's the, much closer. Whatever you want to do in the solar system, it can be done uh, with the university's budgets. We're not talking ag again about hundreds of millions of dollars. It's really affordable. Of course, we will be moving very fast. And so we need to think about how to do fly science on the flyby. For example, if you remember uh, the New Horizons mission, I think it went all the way from Earth to Pluto within well, about almost nine years. So after launch, and but but the whole science phase was I think 16 hours before the fly before the flyby. Essentially, you get the data and then you transmit the data. So now we need to embrace that flyby science, the new paradigm. Uh, we need to sort of the, the balance the thing because we are moving very fast. So we need to be able to process the data and uh, uh, analyze the data on board and send the product. So maybe some higher level of data that we take to the ground for us to, 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 to benefit from. So it will require change in the way we do science operations. But then before we fly a flagship mission to explore plumes of Enceladus, before we'll explore like orbiting Enceladus or landing on Enceladus to explore the plume and the plumes and studying the molecules, we can use solar sail uh, craft to fly through the plumes. And for that, we move fast as, as we launch. But realistically, there are some ways to essentially slow down. And slowing down, I, I can talk about this again. So, but basically the point is we can slow down an approach, do gravitational maneuvers, or maybe use uh, extra extra uh, uh, engine that we will acquire during the solar flyby. So potentially we can start moving through the plumes and collect the data, then to process, confirm that indeed there are some organic molecules in the plumes. And that data will inform the future flagship mission that NASA will fly to Enceladus. So that can be done now. And so uh, the first mission I think we're interested to fly, first science mission would be a solar polar imager, because for that, there is no significant technology development is needed. But for the Enceladus, we'll need this autonomous power sources. Once we have the autonomous power sources, the next step is Enceladus. And so only a couple of weeks ago, we had the meeting at UCLA where we talked about a uh, mission to Enceladus specifically. And for that, uh, Caroline Parker, whom you mentioned at the beginning, Caroline or organized that meeting, a wonderful group of people, and they realized how exciting the objectives, the science objectives of for Enceladus exploration are. And that this that, totally amazing opportunities that are within reach. But if we go with the current, uh, the, the way the... Uh, uh, with the current uh, trends, we can get to Enceladus at the 2050s. So yes, it please. takes a lot of time. It yeah. takes a lot of time, but we can do this with the sun divers in the next 10 years. Yeah. That's a change. 
So, so like when I think about the parrot, like this potentially is a paradigm shift in, in a couple of different ways. One being that you have these spacecraft that have no propellant. They just have the, they're receiving their, their propellant from the sun. And so as long as they function, they can change their orbit, move from world to world, go to different targets, drop down to the sun, pick up another boost. Like as long as they don't go into an escape trajectory, they can keep playing around the solar system. And so you could imagine a spacecraft making multiple flybys of of many different asteroids and on each sweep. So maybe it does a it does a flyby past Venus, goes past Earth, goes out to Jupiter, does a fly and then falls back down into the sun and then goes after a different target. And so as long as these things are still operating, they're more like I think about like say spirit and opportunity, like rovers that just last forever. But they are, um, you know, depending on what their power load is, they may want to just stay inside the solar system and focus just on solar, or you're going to need other kinds of technology that's going to get heavier and slower if you want to head out into the solar system. And you're stuck with flybys mostly, although there are some gravitational tricks that you can use. So it is a different, it is a very different paradigm because it, it feels like you're sort of sending these up one at a time and then giving them different goals one after the other until they die. It's not that depressing. No, 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 it's not depressing. No, no, no. Like, I, like, like, let's go to the sun. Let's do a flyby past Venus. Let's go out to the, out to the Trojan region. Let's come back. Let's do a flyby of Mars. Like, you know, they're, their flyby opportunities will come one after the other at these high speeds. But look, um, there are multiple ways to use the sails here. And remember, I mentioned their parameter, critical parameters, area to mass ratio. For example, if a mechanical system that we are building is very reliable to unfold a sail with the fixed area. So then uh, fixing the area, we are limited to the fact that the mass will be smaller. So area to mass ratio must be large, therefore the, uh, the mass of the spacecraft will be small. So in a sense, we are limiting the scientific capability of the sailcraft for, with, for the fixed area. We have a design that allows us to uh, unfold larger areas. So, but we will focus at the beginning, we'll have a small spacecraft, let's say 20 meter by 20 meter area, pretty much on the, the, on the, on the, on that sail, but then how can we build a larger mass? The larger mass implies a, a, a more capable instruments, for example, mm -hmm. or ability to do something else. We realize that in-flight assembly, that's an amazing uh, tool that we have uh, in, under our belt. For example, when we are flying by the sun, we are flying not one vehicle, but maybe two or three. And so those vehicles are perfectly maneuverable. As we fly by the sun, we're already moving quite rapidly. So now we accelerated our sail, sail cup. The three of them are moving with the same speed and they close uh, move close to each other. Now, if we were able to design them in like in a modularized shape, so it's like a Lego block, you can start a, one sail craft can drop the sails and can, mm. can start proximity operations with the second craft. They can dock, they can transfer the shear right. capabilities. Now you have instruments uh, wow. more instruments on the sailcraft and you can start start assembling as many sailcraft as you want but they're already accelerated they're moving fast but it's it's such a, like like i'm trying to like get across this like when you think about current rocket technology like you have like a three-stage rocket say with the saturn V to get to space and you have to you know, it's filled with fuel and you lose all the fuel in the one stage and then you ditch the stage and you go to the next stage and in in this case it's almost like you're turning this idea on its ear because you are accelerating the individual pieces and then you are losing their propulsion system once you're already up to speed. We don't need it we yeah. can, uh, because basically so we're cool. moving very fast yeah. already. And as we're passing by, let's say, one EU distance from the sun, we still have a maneuverable spacecraft where which the Z component of the velocity will be very large, but X and Y components I still under our control. We have uh, electric propulsion on board, small thrusters that can actually uh, enable our our proximity operations. Once we do proximity operations, one sail craft drops sail, docks with another one, shares capability, and the third one. And uh, now, if you have this capability under your belt, how can you use it? 
Right. Potentially, you can fly an extra solid rocket booster in one of the sailcraft. And that solid rocket booster will allow you to slow down at Enceladus. Right. You can have a negative orbit maneuver flying by Titan, for example. Right. And then actually you can get an orbit around uh, Enceladus. So and one of those that, modules could be an ion engine. Exactly. A fully fueled ion engine. Absolutely. And you have a lot wow. of power derived from the sun directly. So you don't need energy. You actually uh, use the sun and you have ion propulsion on at the sun. It was demonstrated by Icarus, a Japanese uh, sailcraft that went from Earth to Venus. Uh, they used the solar uh, power to drive the electric propulsion on board. The same capability will be used in our sailcraft. So now think about that. Yes, you can assemble in flight. Once we demonstrate that, we have done in-flight assembly mm -hmm. on other spacecraft. So it will be challenging, but it's doable. It's, not, it's, 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 it's something that we need to start doing. But once we do that, you can actually assemble a larger and more capable spacecraft that moves faster. You can now, as you're flying by an exciting asteroid, for example, you can release one of these uh, modules. You can do impactors, impact signs. Impactor signs, you release one of those uh, uh, blocks of your sailcraft on approach to a particular celestial body. And when it uh, collides with that celestial body, like, for example, interstellar asteroid, now you can study debris on the flyby, debris and spectra of the debris. This is, will be the only way for you to actually understand the composition of that interstellar uh, comet or interstellar asteroid. So sometimes with that we, we can use this new in-flight assembly capability for exploring solar system or maybe even interstellar objects. So there are multiple ways to uh, benefit from this technology. And the sort of uh, distributing the capabilities, that is something that we can definitely benefit from. So solar sailing, because they're inexpensive, the risk posture will be very different. Because now, once we build a very large spacecraft, we have uh, multiple levels of redundancy. We need to make sure that it will not fail. Not that I'm advocating for failure, but, but failure on the spacecraft allows you to think more and sort of to redesign and improve it. So, uh, test as you fly. That's the motto we want to continue with. And so test as you fly, if you can afford doing that. Now it's a paradigm shift. Solar system becomes a huggable. You can fly <laughs> it. You, you can really reach it. It's yeah. not only a dream. You can start reaching this, uh, this dream. Flying to inner solar system will be very easy. So, and so let, mm -hmm. I want to provide you like a list of destinations and you give me some ideas of, of like how long the mission would take to reach that, that destination. Like, let's say we wanted to see the poles of the sun. How long would that take? In about a year and a half, you will be in a polar orbit. Wow. And so a year and a half, that means we reach in about seven months, we reach the, uh, uh, uh what is 0.4 AU. You don't, you don't want to be very close to the sun because it will be stable orbit at 0.4 AU. Yeah. And so then you start cranking the inclination and inclination will be changing three degrees every 28 days. And so then basically you're cranking the inclination and uh, in, in the year you're already in, in the polar orbit. And so this is something it's exciting that it should be done soon. Yep. And then there is no new technology development is needed. We will use UV imager to image the sun. We will use some optical imager to, to, to image the approach. And that's pretty much all the technology that we have now. Flying through the plumes of Enceladus. Uh, flying through the plumes of Enceladus, we think it can be done in the free, in the second phase of our sun diver paradigm. Once we will demonstrate the capabilities of moving fast and moving um, with at will in any direction, and once our planar power source uh, power sources will be available, and we're thinking about three years, they will be available. So we can start flying to the Enceladus within five years from now. And so reaching Enceladus within about three, uh, three or three and a half years. Right. But and three so years. Like, like yeah, so a, three it's years a three year mission from the moment you launch to the moment you you get that data. It's been three years. We need to slow down a little bit on approach because as you move through the plumes of Enceladus. If you're moving faster than four kilometers a second, one AU per year, you will vaporize the very molecules you want to study. So you need to slow down. This okay. is why you add a little time. You move fast, you reach that region fast, but then you actually start slowing down. Right. Maybe using uh, Titan as a, as, a, as a flyby and doing some orbit maneuver around Titan, getting an orbit of around Saturn. It will take some time to get uh, to, to, to stabilize. Return to Neptune and image Triton. Oh boy! So in this case, we're talking uh, about uh, uh, four years, four years mission, five year mission. Okay. So it's uh, 
and that's mm-hmm. inexpensive. Uh, it's not only time, the cost. Think about the cost. Yeah. So the cost is very different. We're not talking about hundreds of millions of dollars. We can fly through, and that will be an amazing uh, feat that, that, that we can do. Universities can do this now. Yeah. Um, reach interstellar space to to do the to sort of serve the purposes of the of the interstellar mission. For that, we need to fly faster. And so in the phase three of our Sun Diver paradigm, we'll be moving at the speeds of roughly anywhere between 18 to 21 astronomical units per year. And so now multiply, sort of divide, use that number to access the distance of 150 astronomical units, let's say within uh, eight years. Eight years. So you from launch to to, to the place where the voyagers are right now right. is eight years, not, not 40 years. Yeah. Yes, it will be eight yeah. years, five times All right. faster. All right. And here's the one that is most interesting to you is when do we reach the solar gravitational lens? It will take about 23 to 25 years to get there. So I look, I'm a man on a mission. I need to fly this faster. Because remember, <laughs> by the time I'm, I'm uh, having a 100 years anniversary, 100 years our birthday, I want to see the image of exoplanet. So for me, I'm impatient in that sense. I need yeah. to start flying things much faster. So the solar gravitational lens mission will be uh, will be launched in the middle of uh, mid of 2030s. So for that, we need to get to the sun. We need to go through uh, various flights in the inner solar system, uh, in- increasing the velocity. And so as we reliably are able to increase the velocity, there will be some new material development done that is now that, that, that is now being done here at UCLA at Caltech. So we're developing the new technology for sails that will take us even closer to the sun. For, for that, we need to get not a quarter of an AU, but get into roughly 20 solar radii from the sun. This is where the thermal design will be different. We know how to do this. We have not done it yet. In a sense, we have not flown to those distances. But think about this. We are not going to be standing around the sun uh, uh, for a long time. The total flyby is only 16 hours. So we need to survive through the about a couple days of the thermal loading on the system. And then, and then once we've flown by the sun, the thermal load will be diminishing. And so we know how to do that. We just need to start flying. And you will hear from me very often the phrases, enough talking, let's start flying. Because <laughs> that, that's what we need to do. Yeah. Capabilities within the reach. And so we are trying to do fundraising to bring some funding into flying those missions within the next uh, year or so. So that's something that's very important for us because once we have uh, demonstrated this capability, once the community and our peers will realize that, look, we have something out of a you know, out of a left field came in and we have uh, we, we will benefit the community uh, with this new capability. That's what we uh, uh, this is what we are doing now. What about catching Oumuamua? We will not be able to catch Oumuamua uh, because it's already left the solar system. It, it, mm. it is moving very fast. But yeah. next interstellar interstellar object we should be able to catch. Okay. And uh, we should be able to interact with any interstellar objects as we see them. We don't need to keep our launch vehicle on a launch pad with chemical propulsion waiting for the discovery of new interstellar object. Mm. We can basically build this drone inexpensive sailcraft and keep it somewhere in a uh, high bay in one of the org- organizations on the ground. And because uh, uh, using the right share, now you can buy a seat on the right share pretty often. You can actually fly with a cadence of every flight uh, flight per one or two months. We can actually get any flight, you know, right. any, any flight we want. And then flying and getting with a, a new interstellar object will, will be very easy, will be very what affordable. If, what if you made it the shape of a Starlink? Okay. Right. If you made your satellite the shape of a Starlink, and then whenever you're ready, you just hand one over to to I Elon think, Musk and team, and, and just say, you know, instead of sixty Starlinks that are going to uh, degrade the night sky, why don't you replace one of those with a sun diving solar sail that will t- go to Enceladus? But think about this. I agree with this. I think about this. We can fly those sailcraft and uh, use them in uh, uh, in cislunar space. They will be moving there, doing something. By the time, at the time when we discover the new interstellar object, they're already up there. And so they're doing something. And then we'll say, okay, this spacecraft and that spacecraft change the course of direction, start diving into the sun. 
get the velocity. This is your objective. You need to uh, find that uh, interstellar object. These are the coordinates. This is the flight path. Go over there and explore it. That's what we have. Uh, this is what we can. Because now we have the sailcraft already in space. We don't need to wait uh, for to discovery. They will be doing something in this lunar space, uh, supporting the you know, astronauts on, on, on the moon, uh, supporting for communication purposes, communication and observation around the moon. But by the time we need it, it's it's there. So it's it's that possible. This this is the possibility that I'll open up. Now you mentioned that you are are in the process of fundraising. Is this through kind of traditional government methods, private organizations? How are you raising the funds for this initial prototype? It's a public private partnership that we're establishing, and so with the private public partnership, we should be able to start bringing in funding. It's non profit essentially. So, but the the funding will be coming in, and we should be able to uh, start building the systems. And so, because it should be publicly uh, accessible, so we uh, open up for everyone who is interested to step in and be be part of that effort. Because ultimately, uh, the objective is much larger. It's uh, the flying solar sailing uh, missions. It's exciting, but for me personally, solar sailing uh, the, it, it's a path towards solar gravitational lens. Because this is a technology that will ultimately we think enable. Uh, missions to the SGL. There may be some other technologies that are being developed, like fusion, uh, nuclear fusion. So, but they're still uh, not yet demonstrated as a flight capable technologies. At some point, maybe in the future, way in the future, we'll do something uh, with that technology. But for now, with within the next, within the next, I would say um, five to ten years, solar sailing is the capability that we want to de de develop. And uh, but solar sailing uh, will be uh, will be flying mission in the solar system. And so that ultimately moving towards this is GL, but the private public partnership, that's the key to do this. And so but, the, uh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say like, like you have gotten all of the funding through NASA's NIAC process up to this point, and you've sort of effortlessly moved through each one of the, of the phases you're, I think you've got a phase three grant. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Which is the top, which is sort of the end, like you graduated from NIAC university. Um, and a bunch of the other technologies that you've mentioned, I know are other NIAC recipients as well, sort of coming along for the ride as well. So you're sort of teaming up, but, but it's strange to me that there isn't further runway made available to you by NASA. Is, is that a sort of, uh, why isn't there like what comes next? Like I see this quite a bit and, you know, maybe this is a question for NIAC, not you, but, but I see that sort of these these ideas get more and more exciting. NASA continues to commit to it, but for some reason, then they don't turn into the flights, the missions that is the logical next step for this technology to become. I can't, I can't think of a lot of NIAC awards that have then gone on to become the cores of missions. That's a very good question. I think um, I really um, am really honored uh, by the fact that uh, NASA invested in us. So the NIAC helped us to develop uh, not only the understanding of a slow gravitational lens, but actually the technology that we now embrace and to move forward with. And so we graduated. And I wouldn't say that's a university. For me, I, I jokingly usually say that NIAC is a wonderful kindergarten. So you go through an exciting part of the work with the good the community, wonderful support. And then now you need to graduate and get into university. So essentially you're fast forward without high school, get into university. The tra transition is the challenge. Uh, transitioning from that uh, nurturing environment that we have a good support from the NIAC into real life. That's something is a challenge, but that challenge is, uh, I think it's done on purpose so that uh, only those projects that actually have the, uh, the highest relevance to the uh, science um, to, to the current operations in space will survive. But realistically, I think our project in this case, it's a little bit um, aiming at something that is, uh, um, we, we, we want to bring the future much faster into reality. And so this is up to us to develop this this uh, capability to you know, fundraise and start developing the technology. I think we we, we like the challenge. And so we are, we are moving through this. But realistically, we are working not only with NASA uh, organization, but also with federal government, because the technology that we have actually maybe and is interesting to other branches of the government, where we will start developing those capabilities. It's up to us. We are essentially in the startup phase. And so being a startup, uh, running the operations, it's not a business, it's a nonprofit, but realistically, 
that's it's a good filter if you mm-hmm. really believe if you really think that this is something unique that you put right. your life towards that's something it's it's a good filter once you graduate from this uh university from nayak university and then basically you're getting into the real life that's yeah that's, that's a challenge to have yeah i like that perspective that that the onus is still on you absolutely to to demonstrate to other companies other space agencies other other foundations that this is the right technology and hopefully nasa has helped you eliminate the obvious risks but it still is going to be a a somewhat risky moving forward but hopefully within the realm of what some agency is willing to take on absolutely and they really value uh the support that we are getting from um from nayak and from nasa nayak they are uh, the NAIAC administration and the organization helping us to get appropriate dialogue with the various NASA offices. So they're, they're not gone, they're helping us. And so this is a wonderful support from NAIAC that we have now. But uh, maybe at some point the program must be adjusted at some point, but we are graduated from that university, as you say. Uh, moving forward, I think it's up to us. They gave us the funding to develop the tools that we will need to deploy to argue within the science community, within the uh, engineering community, that what we are talking about makes sense from the science standpoint. What we are talking about makes sense from the engineering standpoint and the mission design and the programmatic aspects. That's up to us. It's a very sizable challenge, but I think we we have enough tools to address it. And that's, I think, plus support from the public. Because what I'm seeing now, what I'm sort of sensing when I'm talking, when I'm giving talks at the universities, I'm sensing the fact that people are excited. I see the eyes lit up when we talk about not only the solar gravitational lens, but the not only the challenges why we needed this GL, but actually we paved the way how to get there and to make sure that we can actually fly those missions in the next uh, next few years. And step by step, I see how the university students see their path towards something exciting. And that's, I think, it's uh, thanks to Nayak we are able to to make that happen. So if people want to find out more, what is the best way to, what is the best place to keep track of this? At this point, uh, maybe contacting me directly or uh, potentially once there will be a nonprofit, of course, it will be publicly known. So, yeah. but at this moment, I think contacting me directly would be the best way to right. get, uh, right. to, to, to get involved. I get, or we wait for us to report on it on university day. <laughs> Absolutely. Look, yeah. we have a group of students who are now helping us to design different spacecraft uh, versions for the sailcraft. We have a group of students who are helping us to, do the, to to make a movie on the development of the solar gravitational lens mission and so to, to make it uh, publicly uh, publicly accessible. And so make sure that the uh, public is, uh, knows about this. So, so essentially, a group of students are helping us to move on studying the solar gravitational lens and the technologies involved. So the group, we invest in the next generation of researchers because get that. The navigator that who will fly the mission to the solar gravitational lens may not, it, he or she may not, is yet to be born. <laughs> and right. so that person who will fly and navigate the mission, who will get me the data from the yeah. I, 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 imaging data from the solar, from the uh, from exoplanet, yet right. to be born. And so that's what the challenge is. Look about this. Think about this. In the past, in the, in the history of humanity, we embraced a very... Uh, large projects. So what comes to mind, maybe Great Wall of China, the pyramids of Egypt, so multi-generational projects. So in uh, in the space science and the space exploration, our projects usually designed to last for, let's say, 90 days, but they last on Mars, for example, for 10 years or 12 years, rovers, but their design lifetime was like 90 days. So we have not built anything that would uh, last design lifetime would be like more than 10 years. But we're aiming at the mission duration of 40 years. That's a challenge. It has to be autonomous. We're pushing design envelope on many, many different areas where a spacecraft has to be autonomous, agile, resilient, we must be able to compensate for any uh, losses for failures uh, of the hardware. So we're embracing the computational activities, uh, technologies. So every aspect of mission design, mission operations now will have to be pushed. And part of those, of those technologies will be tested during Sun Diver. 
So when we fly Sand Everest, will be a fully autonomous mission, will be fully capable of self-diagnosing and uh, compensating for any spinning, extra spinning, extra motion. So piece, piece by piece, those technologies will be tested before we go to the solar gravitational lens. It is exciting. There are so many different things we can do with these vehicles and with this, with, with this paradigm. Well, we're all going to be watching as this continues, and I'm really looking forward to when this first version actually launches. And I, you know, I really hope that you do get a chance to see that picture of an Earth-sized planet orbiting a sun-like star at a resolution where you're seeing oceans and forests and mountains and cities. It's an exciting possibility. So uh, I keep us posted. Thank you. Thank you, Fraser. And by the time I will see this image, I will, I will, I'll decide I'm, I'm not going anyway. So, <laughs> so I will stay I will stay here forever because it will be so exciting to see new capabilities that are enabled and uh, seeing the surfaces of exoplanets. And uh, with your help, uh, with yeah. the help of the community, we will make it happen. Thank Fantastic. you very much for your interest. All right, take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You can get even more space news on my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 60,000 people. I write every word. There are no ads and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at university.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at university.com slash podcast or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent and keeps ads at a bare minimum. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to Jay Dennis, David Giltonen, Modso, George, Jeremy Mattern, Jordan Young, Tim Whalen, Dave Verbioff, Andrew M. Gross, and Josh Schultz who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us.